Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Cliff Schmidt who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Cliff is here today to discuss the Literacy Bridge and the Talking Book Project. Literacy Bridge was founded to empower children and adults with tools for scalable knowledge sharing and literacy learning. The Talking Book Project is the project's major program developing new and affordable digital audio technology to provide vital locally generated information and literacy training to people with limited access to either. Prior to Cliff's work as a grassroots lobbyist for organizations working to end global poverty, he ran a successful open source consulting open source software consulting business for clients throughout Europe, the Middle East, and North America, specializing in intellectual property issues, privacy policies, and community development. He also served on the boards of many nonprofit organizations, such as the Eclipse Foundation and the Apache Software Foundation. In the 12 years prior to his consulting work, Schmidt worked as an industry standards representative for Microsoft as the open source manager for BEA Systems and as a submarine officer for the U.S. Navy. Please join me in welcoming Cliff Schmidt back to Microsoft to discuss the Literacy Bridge and the Talking Book Project. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Well, it's uh, nice to be back at Microsoft. And what I was uh, mentioning before earlier is that uh, during, I was only at Microsoft for a few years, and uh, um, almost all of that time in the product groups. And I remember um, often escaping from regular, you know, meeting-driven activity to come out to MSR to watch MSR talks. So, um, so I hope uh, for the people here somehow that I've been able to take you away from your regular job for a little bit, and for people watching this online, um, that you're also being distracted from your regular job enough to, to get other ideas, because um, I actually really enjoyed that. So thank you for having me here. I want to just spend uh, about the next uh, 40 or so minutes giving you an overview of the work that uh, my nonprofit organization, Literacy Bridge, has been doing. I'll tell you a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve and the context of the, of the area, the, the people that we're um, working with. And then I'll also talk a little bit about the technology, just so you kind of see what that's about, and, um, and then where we're at with testing this. So to give you the, the kind of the big picture question, Right now, uh, there are farmers and, um, and family members in rural villages in northern Ghana. Um, and, and actually, I've got a slide, so I'll show you, show you where we're talking about. So here's uh, in West Africa, there's Ghana. And that circle is about up um, where I'm talking about in the Upper West region. And way out there in areas where there's no electricity at all, um, that uh, there are kids in school sharing one teacher with about 80 other kids in some classes, um, 100 other kids learning to read. These are first or second graders. And they, um, no electricity, no um, running water, plumbing. The roads are, are certainly not paved anywhere in that general northern half of Ghana. Um, and they're actually really, really uh, difficult roads, aside from just not being paved. They're the kind of potholes where if you're not looking out for that pothole, someone's going to die. Your tire will literally sink into the pothole. So this is um, the, the area we're talking about. There are internet kiosks maybe uh, within 50 to 80 miles of any of these places. Um, and uh, and I, there were more in my first trip up there, but they've gone out of business um, kind of figuring out the financial sustainability of some of these. Um, internet cafes, that's, uh, that's something still being figured out. So that's sort of the context. And what we are doing now is um, we're working with local organizations there to allow these same people who live in these areas to get access to information. This is information about healthcare, how to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS or malaria, or um, how to protect your young children, um, neonatal care. And they're getting this information on demand when, uh, in, in places without electricity. 
And so that's, and, and they have no access to the internet, any of that kind of thing. So that's, that's what we, uh, that's, that's the um, a kind of a little bit of a slip, snippet of the vision of what we're headed towards. And we're seeing that happen now since January when we started our, our pilot project. So, uh, so yeah, there's, you do sometimes see some electrical wires around in this area, some uh, kind of hanging around, not actually functioning. Um, that's, that means that maybe someone's gotten some money to start bringing electricity to a region of the country, but not to finish it. Or maybe that those wires were up at one point, um, but, uh, but then uh, they ended up not. Um, so this is kind of typical, uh, a borehole. Uh, you, the kind of village where we're working in is, um, it's a village of about maybe 110 households. There are um, about 1,000 people in the village. There are two of these boreholes, one on either side. And that's, that's better than most villages. It's nice because it's not a well, so it's, it's a little, um, it's likely to be cleaner water. Um, and, um, but I never saw a borehole without a line of people um, around it. So there's the walk however many miles to the closest place to get water, and then there's the wait while you're there, and then they're carrying the water back. And of course, that's water for everything, for bathing and for cooking and for drinking. Uh, and so the roads, kind of the typical roads, this road looks like a pretty nice one. It's hard to show a, a pothole on a slide. Um, I wish I could kind of make the whole room bump a little bit for you, but um, it's, uh, it, it, that's something that you really get when you are in a pickup truck going across these roads you realize that this cannot be the cheapest way to distribute information, is pick up truck over these roads. But, but that is, in fact, the cheapest way to distribute information right now. And then the uh, kids in school. So this uh, first, uh, I think this is a second grade class. And, uh, and they don't have any desks or chairs to sit in. Um, some of the classes we were in, the older ones, they did have uh, chairs. And you'll see some of those. But, um, um, imagine about a hundred kids sitting in a room like this, and this is where they learn to read. It's this, I mean, this is their only opportunity to read. Most parents will know how important it is to read to your children, even at a very young age. But what if your parents are illiterate? Then you really are relying on this one teacher who may be trained or may not be trained, and who has on the order of 80 to 100 children to, to teach at the same time. So that's, that's the, what we're looking at. Now, when I first started thinking about these problems, and I'm, I'm pretty new into all of this. It's only been about three years or so. Um, Literacy Bridge has only been around for two years. Um, when I started thinking about this, I actually was doing some work with um, OLPC, One Laptop Per Child. And I was interested in their project and thinking, how can this be helpful um, around literacy? And the reason was is I'd planned to, um, I'd done a lot of uh, work in Washington around understanding kind of lobbying for um, foreign aid and in lobbying for the right kind of foreign aid. And uh, while I was doing that, I, I felt like I really need to see on the ground stuff in a rural area with a local nonprofit and uh, to, to learn something real instead of this, this Washington level of things. So I planned a trip to Ghana. I spent about six weeks there in a, a very remote rural area. And um, just before going to that trip, I started working with OLPC. And I thought, I wonder, would these laptops be a useful thing around whatever is the biggest education problem Ghana has? So I did some research into that, and I saw what their government was saying. And they were saying, literacy is a really big problem. We, it's a problem with adults, um, but even kids finishing up sixth grade are, uh, have very weak literacy skills. And so um, you know, just their resources were not enough to be able to make this happen. So I thought, OK, let's, uh, let's work on some software that would allow locally produced uh, audio content and textual content to be combined and in a way substitute for that parent who can't read to their child. Um, just a way to practice reading. It's not going to substitute for a good teacher, but it might be helpful. And so uh, I did some work into that until just before leaving to Ghana, I, I, part of the other research I did was looked at Ghana's education budget. And I saw that they could afford $60 per student per year on education. And I'm not talking you know, uh, just books, um, but teacher salaries and the buildings and the bathrooms that aren't there yet, um, which is a really tough thing when you're trying to get girls to come to school, um, which has enough problems against it. So they, they had $60. It's actually gone up a, a bit since then. But back at the numbers I was looking at in um, uh, early 2007, 
$60 per student per year. And I thought, wait a minute, $200 laptop, five-year lifespan, so $40 per student per year um, on top of 60. So we just need a 67% budget increase, and we got it. And that just seemed like on top of everything else that they needed funds for, I felt like that this wasn't a feasible way to address this problem in the short term. So that is what started this idea of can you design a, um, a device that's much more affordable on the order of $10 instead of $200 and that is focused on literacy um, and, uh, and doesn't give you access to the internet and a lot of great things that you can do with a laptop but will be more focused on this particular problem. So that was the idea. Yeah, do you have a question? Just to get a level set, what's, what's, the, what's the literacy rate in that part of Ghana? Great question. For boys and for girls. The, okay. so the question was the literacy rate in that region um, for boys and girls. Um, it's uh, across the entire country of Ghana, it's about 60% um, for adults are illiterate. Um, about 60% are illiterate, 40% illiterate. That's actually pretty consistent with the average numbers across all of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa and all of South Asia. So, um, so India, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan is much worse, it's closer to maybe 20%. Um, in Ghana, the, the difference between uh, men and women is it's not such a high percentage. It's maybe, th there is a difference. The men are, are more likely to be literate. It's uh, maybe on the order of 5% kind of difference. In Afghanistan, uh, women's literacy rate was around 10% recently. So, um, uh, so there are countries where it's much different. So that's, uh, yeah, but great question as far as the context of that. So that's, I went to Ghana to, um, I brought with me, uh, I think I, I have it here. I brought with me just some off the shelf things, like this little digital voice recorder. Um, I just bought a few of these. I bought a leap, uh, leapfrog leap pad device. Um, just a lot of little audio things. And you know, that, that leap pad was selling, I think, at about $20 or $25 for that thing. And then the cartridges cost another $5 or $10 for each book. Um, so I wasn't thinking, hey, this is the answer. But I just wanted to get some, I wanted to put some things in front of some children and teachers and just understand what worked and what didn't work. Problem with the leap pad was um, not that it just broke, it was that it, it it just misaligned, which is actually worse. So if you're pointing at the book, this is the way this thing worked. You had a little book there, and you take a pointer and point at the word, and it would say the word, which is, it was pretty cool to do that. Um, but, um, but actually, after getting bumped around a little bit, it would say the word below it or above it. <laughs> so, um, so I also learned some things about the importance of robust technology as well. So I'd take these devices like this around to schools, and um, I'd have children who could read um, and write, they would start writing stories and then I'd have them read their stories and then I would have other children practice reading by listening to this voice being read behind the, the book they just wrote. And just, just tried some things out and I learned you know, how kids can try to fool you into memorizing the story and just kind of reading along near the words but they're not actually following the words. So I, I learned some things with that. Um, but uh, the other thing I learned was um, that I, I got to see some of the sites. So I saw that you know, even in the most rural areas, there are these markets where you can uh, buy radios. Radios are very common. Um, maybe you might see a radio for 5 to $7. Um, batteries, you can buy a couple D-sized batteries for these radios or flashlights, um, and they cost about 30 cents or so. Um, you know, clothes and soap. And, so, and this thing, this market is only open once a week or every six days in some places. And it kind of rotates around in different villages. So even when you're way out living in, in this area, the literacy rate is probably about 10%, I'd say. In some of these villages, the literacy rate was 3%, like the village where we are. Um, when I give you the 60% number, 60% um, literate, 40% illiterate. I'm talking including, you know, the capital, you know, all the big cities. Like, um, so out in these rural areas, it's much, much, much lower. So, um, so there were these markets. Um, this is a, a typical house. This is the house from the uh, village where we're pilot testing in Vang Vang. Um, and I also noticed that every village seemed to have a big tree, which makes sense that you would have a village near a big tree. And that's where people would meet. And um, it was also where these local organizations uh, distributing information about health, 
or agriculture or um, uh, uh, women's issues, you know, discussing how, uh, discussing with men and women how their whole villages can be more productive if they consider um, broader possible options for what work women can do in the villages and ownership of farms and a lot of issues there. Um, so they would, this is where these kind of meetings would happen and they were typically done by little nonprofit organizations like this one, uh, uh, RAP, the Rural Aid Action Program. So this was just started by uh, a few local people, went off to university and um, in another part of the country, came back and started up some programs. I spent a lot of time with them and I learned that mostly what they do is distribute information. Um, they, they help, they teach people things. They also just pass on knowledge that they've gained from, from their education and from the best practices that they're learning from larger nonprofit organizations. And they talk to people about this and they say it in the local language and they can communicate that because they're from this area. And, um, and so that was, that was uh, an important thing that I learned. And what I saw is that they'd come here and they'd put on skits and puppet shows and they'd, these skits and puppet shows would be teaching things about health or agriculture or um, microcredit programs or um, all kinds of things. And, uh, and people were very engaged in it. Uh, this was not like, you know, I don't feel like going to school today. I mean, it was a big deal when someone came to give you knowledge about something. If you imagine if, if uh, in, this, in our pilot village, 100% of the families are subsistence farmers. So they barely produce enough food to live off of. They, they don't have any access to markets at this point. Um, so if you come to town and you are an expert with information around how to improve your crop production, that's, you're a very popular person. That's an important talk to go to. So as I was doing this, um, I, would, uh, I was focusing on the literacy side. And these people, these people working uh, at the local nonprofits, or at, um, at the Ghana Health Services, the Ministry of Health Extension Service, or the um, Ministry of Food and Agriculture, where they have extension agriculture agents, people who go out to farmers, um, to villages, and they tell them, hey, this is the latest advice. You know, we're getting to this part of the season. This is the crops you should be thinking about. Um, you should space them this far apart. It's better to do your mounds as a big table rather than kind of a round mound of dirt and tears why. They talk about all of these things. And, um, and so I was always just generally interested in what was going on. And I also was always saying, you know, hey, what do you think about this idea of, of a, do a device to help out with literacy? And uh, what I kept hearing over and over was, hey, um, that audio device, so you record something, you can uh, give it to someone, they can listen to it whenever they want. Why can't we use that for our work? Because um, right now we have to get in our pickup truck at the time they were paying about six to seven dollars a gallon for diesel fuel. Um, and then the staff costs with that. They drive out for you know, 20 or 40 or 60 miles. They get to a village, they gather people around a tree, they tell them something, every, everyone who is able to gather around the tree. And, um, and hopefully they'll remember that knowledge until they need it the next time. Uh, and this group might only get to this village once a year. In some cases, once every couple months. In the pilot village we're at, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture can only get there once every year. So they were saying, wait a minute, you're saying we could actually record information and keep this, make this available for people. This could be very useful for us. So it was actually in that trip that I started thinking, maybe what we're looking at here is not just l gaining literacy skills in order to improve education in general and access to knowledge, but do we have to wait for someone to become literate to be able to get access to that knowledge, to be able to get on-demand access when you need it, um, even in a village without electricity. So that was, that was the big thing that I learned from, from the people who were around me who, were, who you know, kind of looked at these things and figured out their own needs from, from what was available. And, uh, and so that was uh, the idea was, I think what we're interested in is access to knowledge. That partly means improving literacy skills and partly getting access in, in any other way. In the same way that all of us were able to look on a web page to find out like, the time and location for this talk, or to actually watch this talk, um, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here is people in a village, but without access to the internet or electricity, being able to listen to a talk that's relevant to their concerns. So that was the idea. Um, 
And uh, so then came the let's figure out uh, what we're going to design here. Um, and the first thing we did was, was think, well, what already exists and can we do this with CD players or tape cassette recorders or radio or um, MP3 players um, and computers? I think those were all of the ones. Oh, and cell phones. So we went through and looked at each one of those devices I just named and thought about you know, how does it deal in, in terms of cost in terms of access to a rich source of knowledge, in terms of cost of operating and accessing that source of knowledge, um, and, uh, and robustness in the field, um, and potential in terms of educational scenarios versus just strict information. And from looking at all this, we felt like we weren't seeing something that, uh, that was really addressing this the right way. So we said, well, let's, let's uh, see what we could come up with. So those are some of the, uh, the various uh, different designs we had. You'll notice this. These, this one here um, is a photo of a mechanical design that we did. Um, here's the, the later design. Uh, this is the one that we have here, so I'll show you. This is our little talking book device, we call it. Um, so I'll be talking a bit more about that in a second. So this is just the mechanical blow up of this. So you have to go through the industrial design and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and software engineering for all of this, of course. Um, and then there's uh, usability testing. Um, Oh, and I'll, I'll show you this in a second. So usability testing, we uh, took another trip out there in uh, April of last year and took this mechanical prototype, put it out in people's hands. It was easier to talk to people about what we were trying to do. I'm talking about people in these local villages who's, who have been exposed to technology like radios. And um, there were uh, 11 cell phones the last time I was in our pilot village of a thousand people. So, you know, people have seen cell phones around. They understand uh, that concept. Um, but to put this in their hands and then to talk about um, what you want to do. And this one didn't even function. We didn't have the, the electronic side ready yet. But again, took the off the shelf thing and took this. And uh, when uh, I would stand up in front of a village and there would be someone translating into the local language. And I, I would say, for instance, you could use this to, or someone could record some information about um, oral rehydration therapy and how a simple mixture of sugar, salt, and water can, uh, can save the life of a child who's, who's dehydrated. And I'd say this, and then I would take this and record, hit the record button when the translator started just translating what I had just said. And then we'd pass this around to people, and I'd say, see, you could push this button, and then I'd hit play, and you'd hear the person's voice saying in their local language this information and, and people started to get the idea. And it, they gave us a lot of feedback on it. Um, uh, we also saw that kids could, uh, could handle the device all right. Um, that was one of the concerns we had, is it, is it going to be too big? The size of the device was somewhat driven by the, uh, the batteries. Um, we wanted to use batteries that were already available um, and being used today were familiar um, and, so, um, and, and also were the cheapest source of power. We're also looking at um, rechargeable batteries and a solar program associated with that, but didn't want to introduce too many new technologies at once. And, um, and then you know, once you get into that, you've got the whole regular distribution of rechargeable batteries and introducing something that just isn't accessible today. So we wanted to start with, you want to power this thing, you can always do it with what you already have. Um, so, uh, so that was uh, some of the things we learned there. I'll just go back to the... Um, the circuit board, so there's our little circuit board that we have. You notice we've got a, um, just a micro SD chip in here, um, a micro SD card for memory that allows us to store up to 40 hours of content with the cheapest micro SD card we can buy in, in any serious quantities. So for a half gigabyte micro SD card, the, um, the market price for that ranges between $1.50 and 250. The market's pretty volatile. and. Uh, uh, that's what we used to store stuff. So we don't have a problem with can we store enough information. Um, it's, it's what becomes more interesting is the usability, the user experience issue of how do you access information without a display, and you know when someone's not literate. Another issue about this is that we wanted to make sure this device worked well for the blind. Um, there are far more people in developing countries with a visual disability, um, but there is far far less Braille. So that's, that's, that's a big mismatch that needs to be addressed. So we wanted to make sure that our first device, um, it doesn't have a display because it cuts the cost and makes it more available. Um, we are looking into other um, devices with displays. But we also wanted to make sure it really was completely accessible. Yes, you had a question? I'm just 
just curious, uh, uh, so, so this obviously has many components that you would find in a cell phone, mm -hmm. and I'm just thinking how the, what is called the bill of materials price for something like this, mm -hmm. compares yeah. to something like your lowest end cell phone, mm -hmm. and what is the gap from your perspective in such a cell phone from this device? Okay, okay great question, yeah, so the question is about cell phone, uh, kind of the, um, I guess one way to put it is, um, why not use a cell phone? What's missing? What's the difference in cost and, and in features? Okay, so um, the, for the cell phones, the, um, the cheapest new cell phone that you can buy in Ghana today is about $35 to $40. Um, the, uh, a lot of people will buy used cell phones. I've bought used cell phones off the street, you know, to sort of experience what this is like. And it's, um, and I actually, I'm sure I paid more than most people. Um, the people when I'd ask my friends how much they pay, I would hear um, uh, $20 uh, was kind of a typical price. Now that's for a very, very, very basic, the cheapest, most common Nokia cell phone that you see everywhere. Which, by the way, the charger for that will, um, will also power this. We made sure to match our, our power receptacle to what's already out there. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact model. So, uh, so, but those cell phones have no, um, they've got no uh, client functionality. You know, you can't play audio, um, there's no storage capacity. So the only way, the only reason those cell phones are relevant as a, to discuss is, um, are you using them to call into some service, dial some numbers, uh, you know, go through a menu and find out the information you have. And our concern with that is, um, now you're paying, uh, depending on the country, in India it tends to be you know maybe only two or three cents a minute. In Ghana, it's about nine cents a minute, um, and so it you know it, it kind of varies all over the place. But that's a lot of money. Um, this costs about two cents an hour in battery power, um, and that's a, a number that I wish we could get lower and lower. Um, but the the thing with cell phones is that. Um, I think cell phones, there are a lot of projects working with, with uh, mobile handsets all, all over the place. I think some, some really great projects. But the trick is to figure out what your piece of technology is best suited for. And I have fallen into this trap before where I've thought, um, you know, some of the functionality, this is, this is actually a general purpose reprogrammable computer. It really is. There just is no display and no mouse, not a big keyboard on it. But we, um, we, uh, it runs, the entire thing can be reprogrammed based on a declarative text file, how it responds to user input, multiple choice questions, um, logging things, all kinds of stuff. Um, I have fallen into the trap of saying, um, so people need to log when logistics materials comes through and things like, well, we could, this is a little PDA, we could do that. And you could do it, but is it the best device for it? You know, maybe something with a display, you know, maybe for that kind of scenario, you're, you're not needing one for every single person. Um, you can spend more on it and other devices might be better. So with that, with that philosophy, I would say that um, mobile handsets are great for getting when, you, when, the most, when the greatest priority is timely information and is, is pieces of information as opposed to knowledge. If you want to learn something, then I don't know of a better device than, than what we're doing now. Um, a cassette deck is, is one thing you might find, but obviously you can't make copies of that very easily and they wear down. S issues with CD players, radio is not something that's persistent. Um, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that, um, uh, you know, we looked at all of these areas, and so comparing cell phones and that—that's why I would say uh, cell phones just aren't the right thing. Even though they're they're overpriced, they're outside the price target for our market. Even if they were within the market, they just wouldn't quite match the feature set that we're hearing we need. So uh, okay, so that's uh, just a just a little quick look at um, and this circuit board and the mechanical design. By the way, um, this is what we're doing throughout 2009. It will certainly change in 2010 as we have pilots. Um, we have pilots starting up now in Burkina Faso and Zambia and South Africa and India very soon. And um, we, uh, we made the tough choice of saying we're not going to produce 100,000 units um, because we don't know that, it's, that this model is actually the right thing to produce so many units of. So we produced 100 of this and tested this in Ghana. We'll produce another few hundred for these other pilots. Um, and we'll learn and we'll find out where we were wrong and, and uh, towards the end of the year I think is when we'll start getting a better idea of what we'll uh, start um, going into production with. So, uh, so here is what we ended up with and I'll, I'll show you this, um, I'll demonstrate this for you a little bit. Um, this is the, the device we ended up with. Part of this, uh, there's, 
I could go on for a, an hour on on why I think it's so cool each little feature was driven by what people in these local villages taught us. Um, but I'll just mention a few. You need a speaker for when people want to sit around in groups. Um, and uh, and also some places it's considered rude to listen to something in you know, sort of privately. Some people don't want to put things in their ears. There's reasons like that, but we do have a headphone port because um, because it's it saves power. And if it is appropriate, it's a better option. Um, there's a microphone built in. Uh, the batteries uh, on the back, the D-sized batteries. This um, this little silicone band to protect it uh, because now that's not a very hard floor, but um, but what we designed it so this little thing would pop off. The rest would would uh, stay pretty intact, um, very intact. This uh, band protects it from from big storms. You know, rain. If you get caught in a big tropical storm. Um, then you, you want this device to still be working. If you submerge it into a bucket of water, I don't know about that yet. Haven't tried that test. Um, I don't think that would be a good idea. The, um, and also dust. It's extremely dusty in the area where we're operating. It's certain times of the year, it's especially dusty because it's just below the Sahara Desert in the Sahel area. Um, it's a, it's a like kind of savanna sort of climate. Yes. It's, very, it's really interesting. So, so you mentioned radios earlier on as being very, very you know, well distributed in that area. Yes. When I look at it, I cannot but see the resemblances, right? And the resemblance to a radio? Yeah, but yeah. In the sense of its functionality and the way it's shared between people and so on. Oh, yeah. As far as how it's, yeah, the scenarios where it would be used, I think, are similar to a radio. And we've. I wonder, that's why, you know, if a radio plus. But the thing what I'm actually exploring in my head is how can this go to scale yes. by utilizing existing stuff. So yes. Um, uh, so it, it, it does have similarities to a radio. And we have had people requesting to put a radio into it. Um, you know, they say, you know, I would pay more. We've, we haven't really gotten into market studies yet. Um, we're just starting to do, we did a feasibility study, and we're starting to do a real uh, uh, controlled impact study. Um, but uh, but we you know are always curious what people think about it and, and document these things and what people have been saying is uh, some people have been saying um, you know maybe not everyone could afford this but I would like the option to buy a model with a radio in it and uh, you know right right so um, so that's uh, uh, so this is the device um, let's see what else can I show you this one thing I learned is that I brought that orange device to Ghana in my second trip. And I said, so you know, what do you think about the feel? Is it too heavy? Uh, you know, how about can you reach the buttons properly? And you know, what do you think of the color? And people generally said, oh, the color's fine. Um, the the orange that we brought was uh, a little bit of a reddish orange, and so we were warned in Ghana. You you do realize that at funerals, that's when people wear red, and red generally has a um, a connotation of death. So you might not want to make it any redder. And then we said, okay, good to know. Um, and uh, um, but when I asked about colors, a lot of times I'd hear, just give us more colors. And I'd say, well, which ones? That doesn't matter. Give us more. I want some options. And so it's, it's good to remember that you know, you're talking about consumers just like you talk about consumers here. And uh, if, you, if you get too utilitarian about it, um, you, you might not be doing, um, doing the right thing. So uh, you know, it turned out we were hearing uh, blue and green in addition to the orange, which kind of got a little yellower. Um, and uh, so that's what we started with. And in that did turn to be a right, the right move. It costs us a tiny bit more because we have to do the same minimum quantities in each of the three colors. Um, you know, the way you do this plastic, they dump all the, the, the stuff into the machine, and then they'd have to clean it out before putting back in the, the other color. So, uh, so now we had this device uh, the third trip out. I took a couple of uh, interns from MIT. And um, and went out here to um, to the same area, and decided this is this was our feasibility test. We had a completely functional device. Um, now it's time to see how this really work. Um, and we went back to work with the same people we had been working with before, like the people who are like teachers and um, education systems, and then also the agriculture folks and the health folks. They were the main people. So I'm talking about one particular district in northern Ghana, where I'd shown you on the map before, and then the government offices there and some local nonprofits um, that serve that area. So we were in this one district and kind of looking at, um, well, we distributed these devices to two primary schools, two health clinics, and the district director of, of agriculture 
and one particular village um, where we put about 20 devices in there. Um, so in a way you could think of is um, service providers from all different types of service and then consumers. Um, although what's interesting is you know in a, uh, a web 2.0 world um, that uh, consumers are producers, right? Well that's, that's true in Ghana, in northern Ghana as well. Um, putting a microphone on here, if you turn on the device, Welcome. If you need help with this device, press the button with the house in the upper right corner or press the right arrow to listen to a new topic. So health you can culture, listen health, to health different issues. topics. Now, I, I just wanted to show about how if you want to record something. Please begin speaking. So you hit one button and now you can start uh, giving some really important, useful information. And you push a button when you're done. Button and now you can start uh, so giving So plays right. back what you, what you did. Now, the, that isn't really that impressive of a test, but let me tell you, everyone loved to do that. The, you know, the, not just the people who were meant to create content, but the, the, and the teachers, but the students, and then even the adults in the village, people love to record their voice. And, and they would record their voice, um, you know, as I'd see people using it, they'd start, sometimes they would tell cultural stories. Um, sometimes there would be a farmer who was not part of the Ministry of Agriculture, but who was um, happy to brag about why his techniques were the best ones and what he did. And so there's a little bit of a kind of brand reputation thing going on there. Um, and uh, so people, that's, uh, that's one thing that we thought about was should we put a microphone on every device or just devices that are designed to produce content? And uh, it's just crazy to me that we spent more than two seconds thinking about that decision in retrospect because um, uh, what we have now is the ability for people to consume content, to create content, and what I'll show you now is also how to distribute it. But yeah, you had a question. So, is there any language barrier? Everybody really speak English? No. Um, great question about the language. Um, uh, so this is in English well, because that's easiest for everyone here to understand. Device, but just to show you how it would work if it was a multi uh, multilingual device. This is the language in the Upper West Region, so I'll turn it up a little bit louder for you. Okay. So she's saying the exact same thing that you just heard in English. Um, you know, if you need help, push the button with the house. Uh, in the upper right corner. And we're always giving cues to help out uh, anyone with a visual disability. Um, and uh, it's, it's a whole, whole entire interesting thing to talk about user experience uh, with this kind of thing. And I will tell you right now that no one who worked on this, um, you know, maybe the industrial designer a little bit, um, but really no one was a user experience expert. So um, we are learning as we go and uh, we could learn a lot more. The, the nice thing is that when we took this device out there, um, in, in the last trip in January, um, before we really kind of distributed a, a bunch of them, we put it in the hands of a few people and we watched them use it. We asked them if it seemed easy and they, they would always say, yeah, so it's easy. And then you'd watch them and you'd see uh, you're stumbling a bit, you know, maybe it's not so easy. And we learned that we, even though we thought we made it fairly simple, it was a little more complex than it needed to be. Um, we had some things like each recording could have its own title. Um, we did things like confirming, do you have the recording correct, yes or no, or do you want to re-record? Things that we thought were kind of smart things to have. Um, but uh, the combination of these things, oh, you could also, after you record something, you could put it into any category, agriculture, health, whichever one you want. You could tag it, so to speak, with multiple categories. And we found out that when someone wanted to record something, they wanted to hit record, record their voice, and be done. They didn't want to lose it. But if they hit record, and it says, OK, record your message. And then you push a button, and then it says, was this the one you want? Play, plays it back, correct or redo? And then it's, um, OK, now give the title. You record the title. Is that correct, or do you want to change it? OK, you got that part done. Now what category do you want it in? And you know, you can see someone who's like, look, uh, I know how radios work. I thought this was cool. I could record my voice, but it's just not fun anymore. <laughs> and so um, what was nice about the design of this is that we saw this problem, and we saw it in, you know, our interns were reporting this in the schools. Um, I was seeing this in one of the villages. And um, we kind of put our heads together um, one night and said, you know, maybe what we need to do is just, um, you record the message, and the way it ends up in a category is you look for the category first, and you're listening to recordings. So, oh, sorry, let me, back to English. Okay, and I'll turn it down a little bit. So, 
You go to the category you want. To listen to messages in this topic, press the up arrow. And you can listen to messages. Um, and here's one, again, in the language Tagari. But if you want to record in that topic while you're in that category, then you hit the record button. And so, I mean, it's not a, a, um, a huge change, but it was something that we were able to kind of restructure the menu by editing a text file. Um, I mean, that part took about 10 minutes. Um, it was the discussion of what is the right thing. So we still have a lot to learn on the user experience, but it's designed to evolve very quickly. What sort of average time takes for someone to get, in your opinion, proficient with this device? In, in Ooh, this proficient. I think that's the interesting question is the definition of proficient and the different levels. Um, it's. Uh, it's on the order of a couple minutes for someone to turn on the device and listen to what it's saying and you know, push buttons and find agriculture content or health content. That, that happens pretty quickly. Um, recording content now is a whole lot better than it was. But, um, but to be really proficient, uh, I think it probably takes a couple hours, um, takes a few hours maybe. And I'll just tell you one thing we learned. We, we went to these schools and we trained the teachers on these devices. And we'd teach them uh, how to use the devices. Um, we'd have them show it back to us how to use it. And then we'd watch as they'd teach their class. And we saw that um, in the beginning that it just seemed like it was too, the, the way they're explaining it, something was wrong. They were writing up directions on the, on the chalkboard of how to use this device. And um, it, it, the whole thing was just a little bit of a slow struggle. And what we realized is then we had, uh, our um, uh, uh, Ghanaian country director was there with us, um, and he was from this region. Um, he got up in front of the class, and he speaks the local language, and he started teaching the children. And he's got a, a pretty good rapport with, with children, but I mean, he's no trained teacher, but it just went amazingly better at that point. And what we realized was that's because he knew the device inside and out. I mean, he really knew it, so he could teach it really well, and it was, it was wrong for us to put the teachers in front of the children with only you know, half an hour of training. You know, it's something that the teachers need to take the devices home, to own it, to play with it, to love it, and then, and then to teach it. And so that's something that, that we learned in this, this feasibility test. Uh, so now this slide here is, uh, that's um, our country director, uh, Andy Bio. He's there working um, with a member of a local nonprofit that, with the building that I showed you before. And um, what they're doing is translating it. So this was when we first started, they heard the English version, and now they're translating it into the language Dagari. And what is, um, was interesting to me about this was that, um, you know, I remember the first time I heard the word localization was probably at Microsoft. Um, and uh, uh, the thing, and, and then also internationalization. Um, and I think I saw some of that in action in a, in a different way when I was watching these two because it was not certainly not a word-for-word -word translation or even a phrase-by-phrase -phrase translation. There was sometimes, you know, we don't have a word for arrow, do we? So what should we do for that? <laughs> and uh, in the discussion about how, you know, how to translate these instructions and um, even things like what should we call this device? Now we call it the talking book, but what we learned is that some people call cell phones you know, the gossip device because that's what people uh, have found doing on it, I guess. And, uh, and what was interesting was you know, maybe we shouldn't really push the name of the device too much. Let's just see what people come up with. Um, but anyway, all kinds of interesting sort of localization issues there. Uh, so here's our interns working with the, the teacher, and this is what we learned we could have spent more time with. Uh, here's a typical classroom. Uh, oh, this is one with older students that have desks. Um, uh, here's another example. So here you can see the kids actually have a device each, and they're working with their books. So the teacher had read a book beforehand, and now the children are practicing their reading. Now the alternative to this is the teacher standing in front of the chalkboard and reading a sentence on the board and asking 80 kids to repeat it back. And, um, and then hopefully somehow distinguishing which of those 80 kids got it and which were kind of mouthing it or not saying anything or entirely lost. Um, so this was allowing the children to, to practice themselves. The teachers could walk up and down. In this case, we, we actually had two teachers in this room, which was unusual, and our intern back there. Um, and they were able to see what the children were doing and help out the ones that were struggling a bit. I always expected that this would not be that useful in a classroom. I thought it would be outside the classroom. It was for studying afterwards. It was you know, in place of the adult who can't read or um, you know, just sort of when you, you've learned what you did in class or you weren't able to go to class that day. 
Um, but the teachers were finding ways to, uh, to use it in the classroom. So here's kind of an example of looking at, at the, the textbook and reading along with that. Now we also uh, went to health clinics um, and these are health clinics we had worked with before. Um, what I should have mentioned is that these voice recorders, um, we bought one of these for every one of our partners about a year earlier so they could start creating content already. So they would just record their voice into it and, um, and then uh, we would gather those recordings and put them on the device so that when we started we had a lot of material to go with. Now in the health clinics, um, uh, what we thought they would use them for is for people who go from kind of door to door, they go around villages, community health workers, and they, they, um, they tell people about kind of what, are the, what the local clinic thinks are the most important concerns. So this local clinic, they thought that, that was a good idea, but what they decided to do after we left, I only heard about this from a, a Peace Corps volunteer who's supporting this project who called me up and said, you know what they're doing at that local clinic? While you remember how there are all these people waiting in line, you know, outside the clinic, um, and you, you can't see that many here, but you know, you typically 20 or 30 people, and they're waiting in line for a couple hours to be seen for whatever they're sick for, for a vaccination, for neonatal care. And you can imagine that the nurses there don't get to spend a whole lot of time with each person um, because you've got this big line. They're understaffed as, as you'd expect. Um, and so what they are doing apparently is that they recorded a bunch of messages on, on the two devices that we left them and they distribute those devices to people waiting in line. So, you know, some of us might be reading a magazine in the lobby while we wait to be seen by uh, a nurse or a doctor and they're listening to um, this content health messages that, are, uh, that were recorded in the local language about the locally relevant issues by the, um, the nurses in the clinic and they're listening to them in groups and then they're kind of passing them along. And this is getting so much more information across to people than you would get in that brief couple minutes you have with the nurse. And the, because the nurse is always going to want to say, okay, I know you were here for this, but um, you, know, you do realize that this is the season where meningitis is a big issue. Or do you know that, um, you know, tell me about how bed nets are being used in your community. Um, you realize that it's the pregnant women and the children under five who are most likely to die from malaria, right? So are they the ones getting the bed nets or is it the elders who have them? And so uh, this kind of information or is now on these devices and being listened to before they're seen. Uh, here's the director of agriculture for the district and he came to our pilot village um, sort of to introduce the program. We, the way we introduced this was we said, okay, there's Literacy Bridge, uh, here's the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and there's you, the village of Vang Vang. Um, the three of us are partners in this project to figure out how we can develop this device to make it useful and to improve conditions, not just in this village or the Upper West Region, but throughout Ghana, throughout Africa and the world. And so um, by establishing that kind of relationship with them, um, it, it wasn't, hey, we've come here to give you gifts. Um, it was, or even we're, we're wanting you to test these things so that we can give you better things. It was, you know, we need your help. You are in a unique perspective to know what works and what doesn't work. And so since January, they've been using these devices and reporting back. Um, and, and they definitely have an ability to break them more than I do. So, um, so field testing this has been really, really valuable. Um, now, when he was there, he also decided to speak about agriculture. He talked about the program a little bit, but this guy loves to talk about agriculture, and he had never been to this village. It's in his district, but a lot of villages are in his district. His staff only gets here once a year. So while he was there giving them you know, the most expert advice anyone could get on agriculture in that district, um, then uh, Andy takes our device and starts recording it. And at that moment began the first ever library in the village of Veng Veng. They, they have no library, the chances of having um, books, a book library is, is low, but now what they have, even with a single device, um, they are beginning an audio library of information that's useful for that village. And it might be agriculture, it might be health, it might be stories, it might be jokes, it might be music, it's whatever, but it's, it's something that where if you own a device, you can get a copy on your own device, but even just the village can have a device that anyone can refer to later, the people who weren't able to make this talk. Now I, I I haven't mentioned one key thing about this is that talk about on the device you can record information and you can listen to it but a really key thing was you need to be able to copy it from device to device even when uh, you have no electricity so this little USB cable plugs into a little USB receptacle right there 
So the receptacle is nice because you can plug that from a computer in and copy things. But if you're in a village without internet or electricity, how do you do digital copies of things? And what we do is just using the power of locally available batteries, um, we just do device-to-device -device copies. So we're hoping to see something of a viral distribution of content as people who appreciate particular pieces of content give it to their friends and they give it to their friends. So we, um, we do think that there is a reason to have a kiosk-like thing, some sort of local repository that, that might be connected to other local repositories. But we thought it was important that in this one single device, you can create, consume, and distribute, the three verbs with content, you know, that, that you can do all of that stuff. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, to me, is the most exciting part of all this. Um, it's, another thing is that, like, in these schools, they don't even have access to a computer. There's no computer in the school, but they can't even get to a computer. Um, and so being able to copy things from device to device uh, is, is obviously, it's, it's just necessary. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. What's the distribution channel look like to get information from, say, a government ministry mm -hmm. out to 500 villages with 500 devices? Right, OK. So the distribution for content, um, I, I do think that there are kind of two typical paths of, of distribution. One is just the locally generated stuff. It's as simple as I just pick that thing up, hit record, I copy it to one other person, and then you know if things go well, lots of people have it. Um, and that might just be me, an individual, or it might be the government's um, extension office in that district. So this, from the very beginning, this project, everything about it is designed around um, locally created content and distribution. Um, uh, so that's one side of things. Um, a teacher, on the education side, a teacher is preparing a lesson and she's using the government supplied textbooks, but she's got her own idea for how you know, she'd like to teach something, uh, kind of a, a complementary thing. And so she records that and copies it to the other devices. Um, now the other idea is, is more the top-down approach. So we are working with the Ministry of Education and the central government and the director of, of education, basically K through nine education there, which is the entire uh, mandatory education in Ghana. Also the only um, free education. After ninth grade, you have to pay tuition. Um, and they wish you didn't, but there's just not funds for it. So the head of that, that part of the Ministry of Education uh, was um, uh, looking at this device and um, we're planning a pilot with them now. They would be producing content top down. So it would go along with the textbooks. The same distribution channel the textbooks take, that's, that's how the, uh, the digital content would get there too. Or you know, if they're, you can send it by internet, put it on a web page, and then the closest internet uh, access point, someone would, would get it there. So it's a little easier than textbook distribution. Flash drives, yeah, is actually very common. Flash drives are extremely common out there. So yeah, that's that's really what it would be. Um, okay, so you and then I think you had one. Yeah. The radio thing. If you had, let's say, one of these radio-enabled devices, mm -hmm. you could do analog distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah we thought, thought about that. that. that um, doing analog distribution over radio, I think, would be great. If we did build this in, like you said, even to only one device, then you've got it there, and then you can copy to other things. Right. Now, you wouldn't get any metadata associated with it. Um, what I haven't shown you is, um, is uh, in the Welcome education side, to I'm going to go to uh, literacy. Good morning, class. We have a, a reading of a, a book here. Today we will do English this uh, I'll morning. I'll turn this up a little bit. Louder this morning. But first of all, let's look at the pictures in the book. Okay, so she's... She's talking about a book. Um, she's doing actually everything. I took a class at University of, Edu of, of Washington at UW on early literacy education. Um, and I just did that just to get a little bit of an idea of some of the principles that teachers are, are being taught. And what I found was actually she was following them all. And when I played this demonstration in front of the director of education, um, he, he also thought she was a good teacher. Um, so she's describing the book. She's talking about the pictures in them. She talks about the vocabulary words. And then she um, gets into the story. So uh, here you'll hear her. Page 26 of your English readers. What can you see there? I can see some animals. So she's talking about the book. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, she talks about some vocabulary words here. Plant eater. That animal is a plant eater. It means it eats only plants. Okay, so there's a definition. <laughs> are my enemies. Um, 
about 200 and Now she gets into the story. Now what we did was um, we hyperlinked the definitions of the words to uh, the words as they came up in the stories to the definitions. And it allows the child to kind of focus when um, we, we put a little bicycle ring and change the light and uh, from green to red. And it, allow, it gets the child's attention and they say, oh, a vocabulary word's coming up. And then they hear it and then if they need the definition, they push this black button. Um, and it gives them the definition. And if they don't need it, they continue on with the story. And that was sort of designed off of uh, a teacher reading to a class and says, okay, everybody remembers this vocab. This is the vocabulary word of the week. You remember what it means? Okay, let's go on with the story. Uh, so we did that here. They were it as the name Dinosa means terrible lizard. Okay, I don't. Did everybody hear what word the name something means terrible lizard? Did you hear the word? The name Dinosa's. She's actually trying to say dinosaur. Now, I thought when I heard this, oh, it must be a Ghanaian English, you know, denosis, not dinosaur. Um, until I played it for the director of education, who said, what was that? <laughs> what word did she say? And uh, she's talking about dinosaurs. And one question was, why are we teaching dinosaurs? <laughs> and, uh, um, and then the other question was, why doesn't she know how to pronounce dinosaurs? And then, you know, the, the room kind of looked at each other and said, why should she know how to pronounce the word dinosaur? She, she was clearly a good teacher. Um, but why should she know how to pronounce that word? So luckily we had the deputy director of teacher education in the room who said, oh, this could be useful for teachers too. So here she gets into the vocabulary words. There were 1,000 different types of denoses. There were tiny denoses as well as huge ones. Okay, so if I want that huge, huge defined. We all know it's something that is big. Like the elephant is huge. Okay, so back That's to the story. Ones. Some lived on land, some lived in. Then she also, we noticed at the end of the recording, she asked questions, you know, reading comprehension questions. Uh, one thing I learned in this literacy class was literacy is more than, you know, pronouncing phonemes. Um, of course, it's vocabulary and it's reading comprehension and fluency and all of these other things. So she had a reading comprehension test. So Question one. we, we re-recorded that for her. Press the right so what does dinosaur mean? Different options and press the black button to select one. Option A, animal with sharp teeth. Okay, it's not animal with sharp teeth. Option B, terrible lizard. So she had actually said in before that the etymology of dinosaur is terrible lizard. Option but I'm, I'm going to skip that one for now. Ancient reptile. Ancient reptile, I'm going to go with that. That is not correct. Please try again. Question okay. one. So I'll go option, back. Option B. Correct. So I did Let's option B. Try another question. So um, I just show you that so you understand that this is, we were doing two things here, access to information, which, which for the most part, the key features are you can record, you can categorize, you can find it again, and you can copy. And that's really what we need to do there. On the education side, we needed interactive capability. And so um, all of that is just something done by a, a, a little, it just reads a, a little text file, the same kind of text file that controls the system UI. And that text file is generated by a GUI app that, uh, that we built so people can drag and drop pieces of audio and build an application that runs on this. Now, that application, of course, only works. Neither of those scenarios work if you don't have access to a computer. I thought that at least one person in the school would be able to get access to a computer, maybe you know once every week or two. I found out that I was right that there tended to be one person, one teacher or the headmaster who was computer literate. Um, but to actually practically get 20 miles away where there was a computer and sit on that for a little while and bring back a new lesson, that, that actually wasn't so practical. So. Um, we didn't include the ability to create those multiple choice questions to add that kind of more rich metadata into your, your voice application because we thought, ah, that's going to make it too complicated. But after that experience, uh, um, we felt that we need to make it possible. So we'll, we're now hiding into the, you know, one of the menus the ability. It's a little wizard that says, okay, record the name of your question. Um, now record answer one or answer A, B, C, D. Now pick which is the right answer. Okay, is this it? Good, we got it. And then that's recorded. It takes a little bit of work, but, um, but you can do it. It's possible. So I think the two things I learned out of that were that we did not make it simple enough for most people, and yet we didn't make it flexible enough in, in, on one end of the spectrum. You know, we needed to include that option there. So, um, okay, so 
uh, last thing I'll just mention is here's a kind of a typical um, uh, uh, um, user experience feedback group. Um, we, we went, you go into a village and of course the first thing you do is you talk to the chief and the elders and you make sure they understand your mission while you're there. Then you ask for the leaders of the community and you end up with you know, 20 to 24 year old men and, um, and really great guys uh, who are excited to participate in this. Um, and then you say, can you give us a little more diversity? <laughs> and, um, and you find out, okay, as long as they don't need to be able to speak English or be literate, um, then sure. And so by, by specifically asking for that, they were happy to do it and understood why. But it's one of those things you, uh, you, you have to push for. Um, luckily, uh, Andy, um, who has a degree in computer science, um, was trained, at, uh, got his degree at the University of Development Studies, where the core curriculum involves understanding how to make an intervention into a village and approach people and to work these things out. Um, so what was nice is the first couple trips, I was doing all the talking and it was being translated. Um, this last trip, uh, Andy ran the show and he and I would just kind of uh, put our heads together to kind of figure out what was the, the most important thing to accomplish that day. So. Uh, uh, so yeah, we did get the, uh, a few different people using the device, uh, you know, just put in people's hands to see how they'd use it. And again, this is the village where uh, 20 devices are still there and where there's a committee that kind of is in, that's in charge of deciding who gets the devices and when and how to rotate it around. And they understand, they wanted to, to rotate it every few months and we said, actually, we'd like feedback faster than that. Can you rotate it maybe every two or three weeks to different people so we get a greater variety of feedback. Um, and this is, uh, again, one of the kind of groups, uh, group where one of the leaders in the community, this guy Fidelis here, who's uh, speaking, um, he's demonstrating how to use the device. Um, the last uh, slide we took from, the, the last slide I'll show you from this village, uh, it was the last day there, and I said uh, to my, my friends there, the kind of the, the leaders of this group, I said, could you record your thoughts on how you see this device being used? You've had a couple weeks using it now, you're gonna to continue to use them, but could you record in your own words, in English, how you think this will be used? And he said, fine, and then I thought, well, let's, let's get a little bit more of a diverse group. And the problem was that there wasn't a single woman who spoke English there, or, or anyone outside of, again, this kind of 20 to 24 year old um, range of guys. So, he suggested, well, why don't I interview the women? And they'll speak, I'll, I'll say, tell me you know, how you think you will use this device, and I'll translate it. And so we did that, and we put it up on our website now. On, um, uh, there's a testimonials section at literacybridge.org, and you can, you can see the photos of the people in the village recording their thoughts. You can hear their voice and hear the translation. And then, and then we found out that even the English translation wasn't necessarily something the typical American could pick up. Um, and so we've got a text thing there too. Um, Kristen, I'm sorry, you had a question okay, before. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so that's what we did in the village. Um, the uh, last little section I'll mention is, we think about this, I've talked about like kind of consumers and creating and consuming, creating and distributing content. Um, sometimes we call it learn, create, learn, share. This device, the talking book device, is primarily focused on the learning part, although it does the other two as well. We think for the, the distribution part, kiosks might be a useful thing, but we don't want to invent yet another kiosk. There's a lot of these things around the world, so we're looking to build some software that can run on, on just a just typical uh, Windows PC. Um, and then in authoring, we've started to develop, as I mentioned, this drag and drop app to develop applications on this, and we're working with the um, a couple universities, um, also the Kofi Annan um, Center for Excellence in ICT in the capital of Accra. And uh, they're trying to you know, kind of create new applications on this. And that's it. Um, the last thing I'll mention is uh, if you like the, uh, the photos on this, um, Scott Sweeney, who happens to be sitting right there, wa went out on this trip with us. Scott and I actually worked together at Microsoft and uh, he um, has uh, been doing some great photography work in the last few years and was willing to go all the way out here on this trip with me. So, um, so he was able to, to give his perspective in these photos. So thank you very much uh, um, for, for your attention on this. And we've been taking some questions, but I'm happy to take any more right now. Okay. So, um, you know, it sounds like 
you, you had an idea for a pro, you had an idea for this thing, and then you kind of went out to test to whether that worked. Um, my guess is you came back with an idea for two or three other things that you had no idea about because whether it's this a change to this device or actually completely different solutions because you find the problems to be different than what you think. Mm -hmm. Um, I work with a nonprofit in Nepal, so I oh, okay. find the same kind of thing. You know, you think you're going to go solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Once you go talk to the people, you realize that ain't the problem. Right. That's the problem. Right. right. Um, any other? Yeah. So, so the uh, so the question was about uh, what what did I discover was was not actually the problem that needed to be solved, and what what you know what new things came up. The the biggest thing was really just the the shift from literacy exclusively to this access to information. Uh, I think that was. That was the big, big thing that happened on the first trip. Since that, uh, I think it's been, um, it's just been little things here and there. It's been things like, you know, I mentioned if you want, if the multiple choice tests are useful to teachers um, you, and you're trying to really serve the, the least served places, you've got to realize that, that if you want them to create it, they're going to have to do it on the device. Um, so it's always been little things like that that we learned along the way. I think it was, I don't think we've learned any really major change in direction since the very first trip when I was out there and, and saw this, this might be even more valuable as just simply access to information. So um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see that. Our, our, the kind of the next steps for this project are to, um, we've, we've got this feasibility study going now, but what we're not doing is uh, doing a rigorous uh, controlled study. And the reason for that is because um, I think we need to find out what the questions are before we go out and, and, and guess we know what they are. You know, if you're going to do the study, you've got to know what are you trying to solve, what is, what is success, what are you going to measure um, to know if you achieved it. And, um, and we just didn't even know. Um, to be honest, I didn't even want to assume we knew what success was. So we work with this village and say, what, you know what this device does. What do you think is success? Give us examples of what you would hope to achieve by it, and then we'll figure out like, what should we measure, and we'll, we'll do all that. We're about to enter that, that phase. Um, that'll be happening uh, later this summer. We're about to enter the phase of asking, asking the questions? The impact evaluation phase. Um, we're asking the questions. We've been asking the questions since January, um, and now uh, we're going to take all that and um, through a program with uh, MIT's Poverty Action Lab, um, which is, they spend a lot of uh, time, their whole mission really is around um, uh, doing rigorous, controlled, randomly assigned studies in social intervention programs to determine what is actually having the biggest uh, impact. And, um, and for instance, one of their studies says, you know, if you really want to increase school attendance, deworming uh, children is the biggest way to do that. And so money should be spent on that until that problem is solved rather than other problems. You know, they're very, very um, uh, um, blunt, harsh, uh, you know, they're about don't fund things that aren't proving themselves. And so uh, I, I have the same philosophy. And uh, even if it turns out to be the project I'm working on, um, I want to know. And so that's, that's our next step. Uh, yes? So uh, my question is about the, the UI. It's essentially like a a wizard, is that right? Like a uh, the, the UI for, for building applications? Oh, oh, you mean of this yeah. this here? Um, yeah, it's... Uh, um, so, uh, actually, I have a question that, like, do they get lost? Number one, do they get yeah. lost in yeah. uh, the menu system? And number two, do you experiment with any visual feedback as to, like, where in the menus they may be? Right. Okay, so the question about UI and, and especially around menus and hierarchy. Um, we assumed that hierarchy might be a problem, um, uh, but you know, but that's it's hard to do too much w without it. And we didn't. What we didn't do. You asked about uh, visual feedback, and we didn't do that because we were trying to get the cost really low, no display at all. Um, I, I've looked into this a little bit. I think there's room for adding. Uh, certainly an LED display, if not uh, an LCD display. Um, we could have some kind of visual indication. But again, we have to balance that with wanting to make this fully accessible um, for the blind. So uh, what we did was, I mentioned that example where there was the confirm if you want this recording or not and the categorization. There was also the titles. You know, I said that we were, we were recording titles. Every recording had a name. Um, a recorded name, and we thought that would make it easiest to find things. Well, what, uh, 
what that required was you, well, the way we had it set up was you started it said, this device can be used to record or play information. Which do you want to do? You know, push one button or the other. OK, you want to play? Um, which category do you want? You've got all the categories, you know, the agriculture, health, uh, starting a small business, whatever, um, pushing the right arrow. And now select that category with the black button. So you push the black button. It's like, OK, now you're in this category of health. Here are the messages you can listen to. Push the right arrow to listen to every message. You go through that. Now select it with the black button when you've got the message you want. Now you're playing the message. When we first thought about it, we thought, well, it's just categories and titles, and then you've got your message. It didn't seem that deep. But I don't know if as I explained it to you, it felt like it was a few different steps there. Um, so what we learned was that that was just getting things a little too complicated. That's when teachers are writing instructions on the blackboard for how to operate the device, which just felt like failure when I saw that. So what, that's where we said, well, if we just simply get rid of the titles, what we can do is a horizontal axis for categories and a vertical axis for, uh, for listening to recordings, finding recordings in that category. And, and that's it. No titles. is So you turn it on. Um, you go to agriculture or health. Um, let's go to, well, I'll go back to health. And you want health, you push the up arrow, and you're listening to the first recording. And it's not the title of the recording. It's the recording. And the title will tend to come first. You want another one, you push it again. And so you can very quickly, you know, I can tap this button 10 times in about a second and a half. And I can get 10 titles up, or I could go 10 titles down. Um, and so, in other words, there is hierarchy, but there is one layer of hierarchy. And so far, that's working pretty well. But it is certainly something to be relevant of, as, uh, as to be aware of, is uh, you know, we live in a world where hierarchies are all around us. And you know, that, that, that wasn't born in us, that was trained. So we can't expect people who haven't been exposed to that to, to immediately grasp that where am I in the information architecture thing. And, uh, and I wonder if a display, it might be helpful, but it also it's still, if you go too many deep levels of hierarchy, it just might be a little too theoretical. Uh, you might also find that people who are blind are like naturally better at I haven't, I haven't found, found that yet. We have, uh, a member of our staff uh, is blind and he's uh, based in Brazil. Um, and he's uh, evaluating what we have actually uh, right now, and uh, and so far it's it's working pretty well. As far as like kind of a natural uh, um, ability to do this, I think um, I think that the the blind people that I've talked to about this um, have had to learn to deal with those things. Um, and I mean, actually, it was great. This guy, it's named Fernando. If it wasn't for Fernando, we wouldn't have come up with a lot of these ideas. So it was more that he's had to figure out ways and had to use products that address getting information without seeing it. And it was his knowledge of this that allowed us to build this device that was you know, primarily designed for people who had sight. Um, and so it was helping lots of people, not just people without sight. All right. Any other questions? OK. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, All right. Thanks a lot.